Shabbat Shalom and welcome once again. This week we are in a double Torah portion. We are going to focus on Pasha Kukat and Balak, but it's so much to talk about in each chapter of this week's Torah portion. So we won't be having time to look into everything. So I'll be only focusing more on Pasha Balak. But the word Kukat basically means statues or decrees. It is, it is a mitzvah that does not make any sense, but we just do it in obedience to Hashem. The word Balak is basically taken from the name of the former king of Moab, who we know from the Torah wanted to hire the false prophet Bilam to, to attempt in an attempt to curse the Jewish people. Now before we get into talking about the Torah portion, I just want to talk about just a few minutes about this month that we are in. We are in the month of Tammuz, which basically means we are two months away from Rosh Hashanah. Soon after Tammuz is over, it's the month of Av, and Av, then Elul, and then Rosh Hashanah. Believe it or not, Rosh Hashanah this year falls basically on the first week of September. So those of you who are planning, you need to remember the high holidays. You need to get a calendar, which reminds me the biblical calendar is going to be available, but this time it's only available for those who are going to pre-order biblical calendars. Every year we print a lot of things and we keep it as stock as if our stock is so much over there in our store. So I'm not going to do that this year. If you want a biblical calendar, you need to pre-order. Pre-order will begin from next month onwards. So very, very important. So we are in the month of Tammuz. Which means that in this, this, this next week, uh, J- Thursday, July the 6th, is basically the 17th of Tammuz. And the 17th of Tammuz is basically a fast day from sun, sunrise, dawn to sunset. Now, the fast of the 17th of Tammuz is, in the Hebrew month of Tammuz, is also known as Shiva Asher Tammuz. To it, it begins basically the start of a three week mourning period for the destruction of Jerusalem and the two holy temples. The fast basically commemorates five tragic events that occurred on this day. Number one, Moses basically broke the tablets when he saw the Jewish people worshipping the golden calf. That's why we are fasting on the 17th, it happened on the 17th of Tammuz. Number two, during the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem, the Jews were forced to cease offering their daily sacrifices due to the lack of sheep. Number three, Apostomus basically burned the Holy Torah on this very day. Number four, an idol was placed in the holy temple on this very day of the 17th of Tammuz. And number five, the walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Romans in 69 CE after the lengthy siege, three weeks later, after the Jews put up a valiant struggle, the Romans destroyed the second holy temple on the 9th of Av. So the Jerusalem Talmud also maintains that this is also the date when the Babylonians breached the walls of Jerusalem on their way to destroying the first temple. The fast of the 17th of Tammuz is basically referred to in the book of Zechariah by the prophet Zechariah and this fast is known as the fast of the fourth or the fourth month. We see there in Zechariah chapter 8 verse 19. It says, Adonai Sevaoth says, The fast days of the fourth, which is this month, fifth, seventh, and tenth month, are to become times of joy, gladness, cheer for the house of Judah, therefore love, truth, and peace. So in other words, if we in the messianic time and the Messiah comes back, these fast days are going to be converted into days of joys, celebration. So if we want to be part of that celebration of when the Messiah comes, we need to be willing, able to fast during these days also. Now, abstaining from food and drink is the external element of the fast day. But on a deeper level, the fast day is an auspicious day when God is accessible basically for people who are willing to repent and turn to God. 
The sages say every generation for which the temple is not rebuilt, it is as though the temple was destroyed for that generation. A fast day is not technically a sad day, but it is an opportune time. It is a day when we are empowered to fix the cause of the destruction so that our long exile will be ended and we will find ourselves living in messianic times. And I pray that it will be soon in our days in this day. The three weeks after the 17th of Tammuz, the question is why do we have these, the next three weeks after the 17th of Tammuz are very important days. For 830 years, there stood an edifice upon Jerusalem hilltop which served as the point of contact between heaven and earth. So central was the edifice to the relationship between man and God that nearly two-thirds of the commandments or mitzvahs were contingent upon the existence of the temple in Jerusalem. Its destruction is regarded as the greatest tragedy of our history and its rebuilding will basically mark as the ultimate redemption, the, uh, the restoration of harmony within God's creation, between God and his creation. So the three the full three weeks of our year, the three weeks is known as between the strictures, that is basically from 17th of Tammuz till the 9th of Ab, are designated as times of mourning over the destruction of the holy temple and the resultant uh, exile, galut, physical exile and spiritual displacement which we find ourselves in. So in this period, many calamities fell the Jewish people throughout the generations and it is during this period between the that, that both the first and the second temple was basically destroyed. So, and one thing with this, even though it is a three week time of mourning, but on Shabbat we do not mourn, on Shabbat we do not, we suspend all type of mourning on Shabbat. Though these days and weeks herald an exile rifle of, uh, with persecution and spiritual estrangement, it is our belief that ultimately this is for our good and very soon with the coming of the Messiah, we will understand that all suffering was necessary in order to reach the ultimate good and at that time the prophets foretold that these sorrowful days will be transformed into days of rejoicing or joyful times. So every Shabbat basically constitutes what? A foretaste of the messianic age or messianic era as such on Shabbat we only focus on the positive element of this period so three weeks should be a time of what do we do for the three weeks it should be a time of increased uh, Torah study and giving time to charity during these next three weeks. Now more details concerning the fasting and all the fasts of the Bible. Those of you who are subscribed to our newsletter, you will get it on your newsletter today. If you have, you have not subscribed to our newsletter, it's a great thing that you would subscribe. So once in a while when we have special teachings, we would just send it through email so that you can take time to read. With that said, let's get into Pasha Kukat quickly. Pasha Kukat basically begins with the law of the red heifer and uh, judged by the sages to be the most incomprehensible. It is it's very difficult to understand. And for many, many years, there has never been a red heifer. And today in Jerusalem, they have a couple of red heifers which are likely candidates. But we pray that basically that God is going to prepare it. All these things are basically preparing for the coming of the Messiah, coming of the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. So we are basically living in exact, exciting times. For many years, the red heifer was been missing, but all of a sudden it is coming to pass. So the law of the red heifer is something which is very difficult to understand. That's why it is called a kok. Uh, in Hebrew, it's basically a statue, often understood as a law that has no reason, or at least a law that a person, an individual cannot understand. So the text after that basically shifts from law to narrative. And after the death of Miriam, the people find themselves without water, which is very, very interesting. And they complain about, uh, complain to Moshe and Aharon, who turn to God. And they then respond to the people in a way that seems to suggest anger. And because of that, they were judged to have acted wrongly. And both are told that they will not enter the land. And in this week also, we talk here about Aaron's death. Uh, the people be complain again and they're attacked by uh, venomous snakes. 
Moses at God's command places a brass serpent on a pole so that all who would look unto him will be healed. This is also a reference that the Messiah Yeshua talks about in the Breath Kadasha about if anyone lifts me up like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, they will be saved. It's a process of salvation. And they, the people sing a song about the miraculous, miraculous well that gave them water. And Moses basically then leads the people into a success successful battle with Shihon and Og. Now, the rabbis basically found the law of the red heifer with which this Pasha Kukat basically opens very hard to understand. Without getting much into the detail, it is they found it odd that a ritual that purified the impure also made the pure impure which is very, very interesting. Now, because of so many things and death happening around, everybody is actually impure. So we need somebody who is pure to basically be the person who will facilitate this ritual. There is nobody else poor, pure but the Messiah himself who will come and facilitate this for the nations of the world. So it seems this ritual seems to cleanse and defile at the same time. It is, it is said by this law, about this law, King Solomon himself talks about it. If you remember when we were learning from the book of Ecclesiastes, we learned about this is the law which King Solomon also talks about in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 23 where he says, All this I have tested by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it is far from me. Basically he was not able to understand what is the reason of this uh, statue, of this coke, of this decree, of the red heifer. Now the first five books of Moses with all their internal variety why is it called Torah? The word Torah itself means law. But the word Torah is not exactly law. The word Torah is teaching. It can mean instruction. It can mean guidance. It comes from the verb yara, from where we derive, it means to mean to shoot an arrow or to aim at a target or to hit the mark. That's what Torah is. So in other words, that if I want to know what it means to walk straight with God, upright with God, I need to know God's word and that's what Torah is all about. Yes, it is law, but it's not exactly law. Now, you can look at law in a very negative sense, but you can also look at law as something that is positive in the right way to live. Now, many people, even our prime minister, he recently went to the United States of America. But what, do, what is the one thing we can talk about the United States? It's the land of the free and the brave. But the land of the free and the brave is basically a land full of laws. Without laws there is no freedom because laws, if you are a person who, who basically understands the laws, you're free. In the constraints of the law you have so much of freedom. So clearly we can, we have here a concept larger than law in a narrow legalistic sense for which the mosaic or the books of Moses have other words also. It's not just law, it's the word for the Torah is not just Torah, the commandments is not just uh, Torah, but there are other words. One word, another word for some of the commandments of the Torah is uh, kok or kukat. Kukat basically means laws which have no meaning, have no understanding. It, is, it has no logical explanation. But I do it because God tells me to do it. Then there is laws of mishpat. Mishpat is judgment. Judgment is certain things that causes me to judge certain things. I need to understand these are things that I need to do. Then edut is basically testimony. Certain, certain commandments give God the glory. Like keeping Shabbat is a testimony unto Hashem. Then there are certain commandments which talk about deen or judgment. And mitzvah. Mitzvah is basically the concept of getting, getting attached to God or being one with God. So... So in, in that sense, we need to understand the Torah does sometimes have a narrow meaning 
roughly the procedure to be followed in such and such a case. But in a more general sense, it seems to mean guidance as it emerges not from laws but also from history. So Torah in this broad sense is also about the counterpoint, the creative tension between law and life, between the world as it ought to be and the world as it is. And the Torah tells us that law is not merely a set of rules whose only logic is that they are, to, they are the will of God. Now, we need to understand our faith is not a matter of blind obedience. We need to understand what we believe in. That is why we discuss, that is why we talk, that is why we look at different scriptures and we look at what the sages write. Because it's not just about, because he said I'm going to do, it's not, it's not just about blind faith. Now, astonishingly, despite the fact that the Torah is full of commandments, 613 in total according to tradition, Believe it or not, there is no word in biblical Hebrew that means to say, to obey. There is no word in biblical Hebrew to say, to obey. The word used by the Torah, which we say Shema, it means more than just to obey. It means more than that. So it's, we need to understand that. So the, the word, of we, even though we say Shema, it basically means hear and obey. It's not just to obey. It's beyond just the concept of obey. There is no one single word. So the whole concept of obeying is that it's not just blind faith. I'm obeying because I'm in love with God. I want to serve God. I want to be a testimony to God. I want to, even if I don't understand, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do it. That's what the whole concept of Torah and following God is. So... Now, I, how many of you actually read this week's Torah portion? Have you read it? At least Pastor Kukat. Now, amidst all these themes that are happening in Pastor Kukat, it is easy to miss, miss a significant short passage towards the end of Pastor Kukat. It is very brief. It is very cryptic. It is almost unintelligent certainly does not seem to represent a major idea. What is it? It's found in Numbers 21, verses 14 through 15. It says, this is why it says, in the book of the wars of Adonai, Vahi at Suf, the Vadis of Aaron, the slope of the wadis extending as far as the site of Ar, which lie next to the territory of Moab. Have you read that? I'm first time seeing this pastor. Is it really there? Open your Bibles and see. The question you need to ask ourselves if you read it, have you asked the question, what is this about? If you're not asking questions, you're not studying Torah. Any education of God's word without questioning what is this about is not education. But what is this about? It's there in the Bible. I know most of us just read through, but we are not understanding what we are reading. That's why I tell you people that when we read, it's very important to understand what we are reading. We need to ask questions, we need to stop, we need to pause, we need to think, we need to search, we need to ask help. What does this mean? I'm not going to tell you what this means today. But this is a powerful uh, verse that talks so much in this verse that I don't want to talk about it today. Hopefully, maybe next year we'll see if it goes well. Let's go to Pasha Balak. Pasha Balak, Balak is the king of Moab who basically fears, to up, uh, fears the approach of the Israelites. And together with the elders of Midian, he attempts to hire the well-known Mesopotamian prophet Bilam to curse them. Bilam basically consults with God who tells him not to go but the Moabites and the Midianites return with another offer. This time God instructs Bilam to accompany them, but only to say the words he puts in his mouth. 
After a strange episode in which Balaam's donkey sees an angel blocking the way, Balaam and Balaam basically ascend the mountain overlooking the Israelite camp. Three times at different places, they prepare altars, sacrifices, and each time Balaam utters a blessing instead of curses. Balak basically leaves in anger and frustration, and having been spared of Balaam's or Bilam's curses, however, the Israelites bring disaster upon themselves through idolatry, through adultery, seduced by the local woman. 24,000 people die in a plague that strikes the camp until Pincus, in an act of zealousness, zealotry, rises up against the wrongdoers. Now, the story of Balaam, the pagan prophet, begins with a bewildering set of sequence of events that seems to have no logic. The context, context is that the Israelites were approaching the end of their 40 years in the wilderness. Already they had fought and won the wars against Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Balaam, Bashan. They had arrived at the plains of Moab, the plains of Moab is today basically the southern Jordan at the point where it touches the Dead Sea. Balak, king of Moab, was concerned and shared his distress with the elders of Midian. And the language, if you see, of the Torah is, uh, at this point, is precisely almost similar to the reaction of the Egyptians at the beginning of the book of Exodus. So let's see what it says over there in Exodus chapter 1, verse 9 through 12, 9 and 12. Concerning Egypt, Pharaoh said to his people, Here, the children of Israel is more numerous. The Hebrew word over there for numerous or great is the Hebrew word rav, and powerful than we. And verse number 12, and the Egyptians felt a disgust via kutsu at the children of Israel. In this week's Torah portion concerning Moab, it says in Numbers 22 verse 3, Moab, he felt very fearful because the peop of the people because they were what? Numerous. Against the same Hebrew word, Rav. And Moab, what, what did Moab feel? He felt a disgust via cuts at the children of Israel. And the strategy of Balak adopted was to seek the help of a well-known seer and diviner known by the name of Bilam. In fact, the historical background to Bilam's narrative is a well-attested narrative. It's not just a story. It is historically proven that there used to live a man called Bilam in those days at that time in that area. Several Egyptian poetry or several Egyptian pottery fragments dating the second millennium BCE have been found containing ex, uh, text curses directed against Canaanite cities. In fact, if you, uh, you would also see that it, is, it, it was the custom among pre-Islamic Arabs to hire poets thought to have to be under divine influence to compose curses against their enemies. As, 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 a, as for Bilam himself, there was a significant discovery that was made in the year of 1967 by Bill Arnold and Brian Bayer, where they, they, they say that a plaster inscription on the wall of the temple at Deir Hala in Jordan dated in the 18th century BC, was found to make reference to the night vision of a seer called Balam ben Beor, the, re the earliest reference in archaeological sources to have named an individual in the Torah. So Balaam was not just a story that is made up in the Torah. It is, he was an historical figure, and today we have archaeology prove that it is true. And this is one of the books that if you're interested to read to understand history. So thus, 
through the story itself, though the story itself contains elements of, of parable, it belongs to a definite context in time and space. In fact, uh, uh, a fun fact, if you want to like to know, the first ever telegraph message from Washington dated May 24th, 1844, quoted the words of Bilam from Numbers 23, 23, where it says, what has God brought upon us? So the character of Bilam remains uh, ambiguous, both in the Torah and subsequent Jew Jewish tradition. Was he a diviner reading omens and signs, or a sorcerer practicing occultic practices? Was he a genuine prophet or was he a fraud? Did he, did he ascend to the divine blessings placed in his mouth or did he secretly wish to curse Israel? According to some uh, interpretation of the sages, he was a great prophet equal to the stature of Moshe Rabbeinu himself. And others basically said that he was a fake prophet with an evil eye who basically sought the Israel's downfall. So today what I would like to do quickly in the remaining time we have, I would like to examine neither Bilam nor his blessings, but rather the whole preamble of the story for it is here that one of the greatest or deepest problems ar arise, namely, what did God want Bilam to do? That is the question. What exactly did God want Bilam to do? This drama which we read in the scriptures has basically three seeds. In the first, the emissaries arrive from Moab and Midian. Now when we are learning about the whole story of Bilam, we need to understand there is a fragment of Bilam in us also. He was not interested in blessing the people. He was interested in cursing the people. He wanted to basically, if you look at uh, Bilam and Amalek, they basically, especially in Hebrew, they have the same letters all together. What does Amalek want to do? Kill the people. What do Bilam want to do? Kill the people. But the amazing part of Bilam is that because Balaam had uh, basically hired him, God did a supernatural intervention. The intervention that basically took hold of his vocal cords that even though he wanted to curse, God changed it within him and caused that what he wanted to do not to happen and God pronounced the blessing through the mouth of the evil prophet Bilam because the children of God were blessed by God. Which basically means that when we are people of God, under the covering of God, under the protection of God, no matter whatever people want to say, heaven and earth may pass away, but God's word and God's promises will truly be made because we are under the protection of the, of, the, of the maker of the universe, the creator of everything. So in this first scene we see the emissaries arrive to Moab and Midian. They state their mission. They want Bilam to curse the Israelites. Bilam's answer is a model of propriety. What does he say? He says, stay the night, he says, while I consult with God. And what was God's answer? God's answer is very clear. We see in Numbers 22 verse 12. But God said to Bilam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. Obediently, Bilam refuses. Balak redoubles his efforts. Perhaps more distinguished messengers and the promise of a significant reward will pursue Bilam to change his mind. And with that, now the second scene begins to unfold. This time, a new and a more impressive set of emissaries or emissaries basically arrive offering a very great honor should be given. So... Uh, the, the, the level of the authorities have now increased. It's not just the people who are working in the offices now. It's the prim, prime minister, the president, and leaders everywhere is coming. And again, what is, what is Bilam's reply? Bilam's reply in 2218 of Numbers is, even if Balak were to give me his palace 
filled with silver and gold. I would not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of my of the Lord my God. I mean, such a holy guy, you know. He does not want money. He does not want silver. He does not want anything, you know. I'm just an obedient servant of God. I don't want to do anything. However, after he says this, he adds one more sentence, which is very important to know. What does he say in verse number 19? Now, stay here tonight as the others did and I will find out what else the Lord will tell me. I mean, you just said I don't want anything, then why should I stay? You already heard that God told you not to go, then why are you asking again? I mean, I mean the implication is very, very clear. Bilam is suggesting that it is possible, you know, God can change his mind. So let's just, you know, I mean, how fickle-minded can Bilam be? God changing his mind. If God had to change his mind, then there is there would be no covenant at all. There would be no nation of Israel at all. So a God that changes mind is not a God of the Bible. It's something else. This seems to be very impossible. That, but that's not what God does according to the text. Yet, to our surprise, that is precisely what God appears to do. It says in verse 22, 20 of Numbers, that night God came to Bilam and said to him, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Initially, God said, do not go. Now, he says, go. Now, the difficulty really appears immediately in the next scene of the text. It says in Numbers 22, 21 and 22, Bilam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, went with the princes of Moab, and what happened? God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. What's happening over here? The previous night, God said, go, Balaam went, then God is now very angry because he went. What's wrong with you, God? What is happening? I mean, has God changed his mind not once, but twice in the course of the single narrative? I mean, if you're reading this text, especially in English or any vernacular language, your, your mind, your brain is going, what's wrong? What's going on here? What was, what, what was Balaam supposed to do? What, did, what, did, what do you want, God? Please tell me, you first tell me to go, then you tell me not to go, then you are angry because I am going. I mean, what exactly it is? Because the text offers no explanation. Instead, the narrative shifts into the famous scene of Bilam's donkey. Itself is a mystery in need of interpretation. Let's see over there. Numbers 22, 22 to 31. Bilam was riding on his donkey and Two, and his two servants were with him. The donkey, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a, he was not just standing, he had a sword drawn in his hand. It turned off the road into the field. Balaam beat it back to the road. The angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with, with walls on both sides. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Bilam's foot against it. So he beats it again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there is no room to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, I give up. I laid, laid down under Bilam and he was angry and beaten with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Bilam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? I mean, I, I don't know about you, if your pet animal would begin to talk, I don't know if, what, what, what will be your response if our cats and our dogs would begin to talk back to us. Here the Torah basically says, you know, Bilam, it, it, was, it was like it was just an any ordinary thing. It, it, instead of being surprised or taken back or waiting in amazement, he, he talks back to the donkey and he says, you know, Bilam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would have killed you right now. The donkey said to Bilam, am I not your own donkey? which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. And then the Lord opened Bilam's eyes 
and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and, 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 his, and fell face down. This is amazing. This, this is not the first time we have ever heard an animal talking. Way back in the Garden of Eden, there was another animal that talked. So there is this connection over here with this incident of Bilaam, which takes us back to the Garden of Eden, which is another teaching of its own, which we don't have time to really get into this morning. But the, the commentators offer various ways of resolving contradictions between God's first and second reply. Let's see what the Rambam says. His commentary to Numbers 22, verse 20. The Rambam says, according to the, uh, according to the Rambam, he says, God's first statement, do not go with the meant, do not curse the Israelites. His second, go with the meant, go, but make it clear that you will, you will only say the words I will put in your mouth, even if they are words of blessing. God was angry with Balaam, not because he went, because, but because he did not tell them of this provision that God was saying. In fact, the 19th century uh, rabbi known by the name Malbim and Rabbi Ziz Hirsch, they suggested basically a different answer based on the closed uh, textual analysis. Now, their suggestion of what the verse basically means is basically based out of Hebrew. That is why it's very important that you learn Hebrew. Learning Hebrew is for Torah education to understand because these things will not ever be found in your English or your vernacular language. They say the Hebrew text uses different words for with them in the first and the second divine replies. When God says, do not go with them, the Hebrew over there is imahem. When he later says, go with them, the corresponding word is itam. The two prepositions have subtly different meanings. Imahem basically means with them mentally as well as physically going along with their plans. Itam means with them physically, but not mentally. In other words, Balaam could accompany them, but not share their purpose or intention. But God was angry when Balaam went because the text says over there in Numbers 22, 21, that he went in with them. In other words, he identified with their intention, with their mission. He wanted to do what they wanted in their heart. So this was an ingenious solution. The only difficulty is verse 35 in which the angel of the Lord having opened Bilam's eyes finally tells Bilam, go in with them. Now according to the Malbim, this is precisely what God did, not what Bilam wanted to do. There is however an alternate answer. The hardest word to hear in any language is what? No. Those of you who have, those of us who have children, even our children don't like no. And as adults, you think we like no? <laughs> That's what's happening over here. Balaam had asked God once, what did God say in the beginning? No. That should have been enough for Bilal. But yet, he went and asked again. In fact, in, in that act, he betrayed his essential character. He knew that God did not want to go, or want him to go, yet he invited the second set of messengers to wait overnight in case God had changed his mind. Now friends, do you think that the God of the Bible is a God who changes his mind. Now if you think so, that means you have not understood the God of the Bible. What if, what if he, I mean, so some people say, God wanted me to follow you once, and after five years they say, God, God doesn't want me to follow you. I mean, which God is this? Your God is such a fickle-minded God, that one day follow, another day don't follow. That means one day there is covenant applicable for Israel. Next day there is no covenant applicable for Israel. One day God is going to be loving to you. Next day he's not going to be loving to you. That means that's not true. 
I mean, God does not change his mind. Why didn't you tell your neighbor? God does not change his mind. Tell another neighbor the same thing. No, you don't like it. Find somebody else. He's not in the business of changing minds. He knows what he said. When he said, no, we don't have to go and ask him hundred more times. Some of us, God told me no, so I'm just going to pray, 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 pray until he changes his mind. We think that prayer is a form that I can, you know, somehow twist the hand of God to make him say yes. You know, like the strong get a hold of other guys' hands, you know, and tell them, I'll twist it, say yes, say yes, say yes. That's the idea over there. But that's not what, that you can, that's not what you can do for God. Therefore, Bilam's delay said something not about God, but about himself. He had not accepted the divine refusal. He wanted to hear yes. And that is indeed what he heard. Not because God wanted him to go, but because God speaks once. And if we refuse to accept what he says, God will not force his will upon us. Very, very important for us to understand that. The yes was never because God wanted him to go. He already told you his will. I already know his will. Why do I have to waste my time doing anything else? Many of us, we're seeking God for an answer. We know God's will. We know what is written in God's word. Why does God need to speak to you? His word has given you clarity. His word has told you what you need to do. Why does he have to give divine inspiration? You know what to do. But you just think, what if in case God changes his mind? If you're believing in such a God, you're not believing in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, the sages put it like this in Makot 10b. Man is led led down the path he chooses to tread. You want to go this path? God's not going to stop you. You don't want to work with God? God's not going to stop you. You have chosen to go away from God? Fine, that's your choice. That's your prerogative. That's your life. You will have consequences to it. No problem. Remember the story of the parable of the loving father in Luke 15, where it talks about the, a, a father having two sons, and the younger son basically wanted a share of his property. Even though it was very difficult for the father to give, the father gave it because he said, son, I love you no matter what. You will, if you want my share, I'll give you a share. I divided the share I give you because that's what you want. Not because that's my will. That's not, not because I, that's my desire. That's because you want. You don't want to say in my house. You don't want to be with my fellowship. You don't want to be with me. You want to walk your path. Go ahead and walk your path. Man is led down the path he chooses to tread. So the true meaning of God's second reply go with them is if you insist then I cannot stop you going but I'm angry that you should have asked a second time. God did not change his mind at any point of these proceedings, in scene number one, in scene number two, in scene number three, God did not want Bilam to go. His yes in scene two meant no. But it was a no Bilam was not prepared to hear. When God speaks and we do not listen, he does not intervene to save us from our choices. Why? Because man is led down the path he chooses to tread. You don't want to walk in the ways of God. You don't want to follow hard after God. You want to do what you want to do. God says, fine. I can't do anything because that's your choice. That's the power of free will. You need to choose if you want to walk with God or you don't want to walk with God. But God was not prepared to let Bilam proceed as if he had a divine consent. So instead, of, instead he arranged the most elegant possible demonstration of the difference between true and false prophecy. A false prophet speaks. 
a true prophet listens to God. A false prophet tells people what they want to hear. They tell you for your tickling ears. Especially when people come for advice, when we don't give them advice to what they like. They think, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. Friends, as a leader of the community, I need to know what God wants to tell you. Not to pamper you like a baby. You need to learn to depend on Hashem. You need to find your residence, your comfort from God. But God desires to do something. If, you were, if I had to tell you what you had to hear, then you're not going to do anything with your life. You're not going to shape up. You're not going to move. A true prophet tells them what they need to hear. The, the false prophet believes in his own powers. The true prophet knows that he has no power. A false prophet speaks in his own voice, but the true prophet speaks in a voice not his own. In fact, it says concerning Moses in Exodus 4.10. Moses, what did he say? I am not a man of word, said Moses. What did Jeremiah say? Jeremiah said, I cannot speak for I am a child. The episode of Bilam and the talking to your donkey is a pure humor. One thing provokes divine laughter in, in the Tanakh or in the Bible is namely human pretension. When you begin to pretend, when you begin to act, you think that you're, you're getting away with your life, getting away with sin. You know, God can see that pretension. He can see the motivations of your heart. He can see what is really happening. And God basically laughs at such people. You thinking you're getting away? No, you're not getting away. I'm just allowing you to go because that's the path you want to go. Balaam had won the one had won renown as the greatest prophet of his day. His fame had spread to Moab and Midian. He was known as a man who held the secret of blessings and curse. God now proceeds to show Balaam that when he so chooses, even Balaam's donkey is the greatest prophet than him. God can use anybody who is available to him. It can be a donkey also. If you're not willing to serve God, God is going to basically use the animals. That's what the scriptures also say in the Breath Kadasha, that if you don't open your mouth and serve God, worship God, God's going to cause the rocks to sing unto him, to praise him, to glorify him. So it's up to you to decide how you want to do it. Now, that's why during worship services I see people, you, I, I want to have a breakthrough, but I don't open my mouth. How will you have a breakthrough if you don't open your mouth? Your breakthrough comes with the words that you speak. Most of the time during the week, I just speak words of negativity. I speak words of curses. I speak words which bring basically death into my life. But if I want to have a breakthrough, when we sing songs or when we say the prayers, you need to open your mouth. But I don't understand. It doesn't matter. You don't understand. Open your mouth. And as you begin to open your mouth, by faith, your mind will tell your heart to believe. And your heart will tell your mind to believe. And there will be this, this love connection between your heart and mind and this connectivity will cause faith to arise are you with me silence does not cause faith to arise by keeping your mouth shut does not cause faith to arise the enemy does not want you to open your mouth because the enemy knows the minute you open your mouth by faith you will experience the power of God in your life the donkey sees what Balaam Balaam cannot see the angel standing in the path, barring his ways. God humbles the self-important, the proud, just as he gives importance to the humble. When human beings think that they can dictate what God's will says, God begins to laugh. And on this occasion, we too can laugh along with God with what he is doing over here. Some years ago, there was this rabbi who was on the process of making a television program for a TV channel. But he faced the following problem. He wanted to make a documentary about repentance, about Teshuvah. 
but he wanted to do it in, in such a way that it would be intelligible in, intelligible to non-Jewish people as well as Jewish people, including those people who had no religious belief at all. What secular counterpoint could he choose that would illustrate the whole concept of repentance that would basically send the message to believers and to non-believers, secular and religious altogether? So he decided the best way of doing it was basically to go and look uh, uh, at a place that basically deals with the drug addicts. They had developed behavior that they knew was self-destructive, but was also addictive. To break the habit, they would basically involve themselves into immense reserves of will. They had to acknowledge that the life they led was harming them and they had to change. They had, in other words, to go through a secular uh, equivalent of teshua or repentance. So what this rabbi did was he basically spent a day in a rehabilitation center and he said it was very heartbreaking. The young people there, he said, they were aged between 16 and 18 all coming from broken homes. Many have suffered abuse. Other than the workers at the sentence center, they had no networks of support. The staff was made up of exceptional people. Their task was mind numbling difficulty. They would succeed in getting the addicts to break the habit for days, or weeks at a time, and they would again re relapse, and the whole process would have to begin again. He began to realize that their patience was little less than a human reflection of God's patience with us. However many times we fail and have to begin again, God does not lose faith in us, and that gives us strength. Here we were people doing God's holy work, rescuing people who were into the sin or into the addiction of, of uh, drugs. He asked the head of the center, who was a social worker, what is it that she gave the young people that made a difference to their lives and gave them the strength to change? He said, I will never forget the answer that she gave because the answer she gave was one of the most beautiful answers that he has ever heard. She said, we are probably the first people they have met who care for them unconditionally. And we are the first people in their lives who cared enough to say no. If somebody tells you no, it's because they care for you. If God says no, it's because he cares for you. If your spiritual leaders say no, it's because we care for you. There is no personal agenda involved here. No is for your soul. Something that you cannot see on the external. Something that is there internal. You need to learn to trust a sign of your, your trusting God is a sign of trusting the leaders God has placed you under. If you lack trust with the leaders you are under, it's a clear sign that you don't trust in God Almighty whom you cannot see. Friends, no is the hardest word to hear. But it is often the most important and the sign that someone cares for you. To that Balaam was humble and eventually he learned and what we too must discover that if we have to be open to the voice of God. Amen. Now one of the most profound and influential comments that, have, that, has, that was ever made about Jewish history was made by this pagan prophet Balaam in Parsha Balak. See what he says in Numbers 23 verse 9. As I see them from the mountaintops, gaze on them from the heights. 
Behold, it is a people that dwells alone. Not reckoned among the nations. The people of God, they're serving God. They're people who dwell alone. You know, in your journey of your walk with God, sometimes there won't be friends. The problem with our generations, we always want friends. I want friends. Are you walking with God? Look at what Bilam says. The people that dwells alone. You might not have friends in this journey. Because this journey is not an easy journey. It is a journey that you cannot compromise. It is a journey that calls you for a higher calling. It is a journey that causes you to be a testimony unto God. And in this journey you cannot live according to the fims and fancies of the world. You cannot live like you lived before. It is a journey that calls you to commitment. It is a journey that calls you to overcome. It is a journey that calls you to a path of righteousness. To many Jews and non-Jews, admirers and critics alike, this has seemed to epitomize the Jewish situation. A people that stands outside history and the normal laws governing the fate of nations. For Jews, it is a source of pride. For non-Jews, it, it, it has too often been a source of resentment and hate. Who the hell do these people think they are? Who, why should we even care for them? They call themselves chosen people. You don't understand what it means to be chosen people. You don't understand what it means to be a people belonging to God. For centuries, Jews in Christian Europe were treated in the, verb, in the words of uh, Max Weber's phrase, a paria people. All agreed though, the Jewish people are different. The question is if they are different. And those of us through the Messiah who have been engrafted into the Jewish people are also different. The question is how are we different? Why are we different? The biblical answer is surprising and profound. It is not that Jews alone knew God. That, 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 that is manifestly not the case. In fact, if you look in this week's Torah portion, Bilam, the prophet who uttered the words was, was not an Israelite. And, or even if you look at Avi Malek or Lavan, to whom God appears in the book of Genesis, they were not people who believed in the God of Abraham. Abraham's contemporary, in fact, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the city that later became Jerusalem, is described as a priest of God Most High. Yitro, the father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu, he was a Midianite high priest, yet the Pasha contains the supreme moment of Jewish history, the revelation at Mount Sinai, it, a, a whole Pasha, a Torah portion is guess his name as Pasha Yitro. Even Pharaoh, who ruled Egypt in the days of Joseph, said of, of, of Joseph, can we find anyone like this man in whom is the spirit of God? So God does not appear only to Jews or members of the covenantal nation, nor does he answer only Jewish prayer. In fact, at the dedication of the temple, King Solomon made the following request. In 1 Kings chapter 8, 41 to 43, he said, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for men will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. And when he comes and prays towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel and may that be, and may know that this house that I have built bears your name. The sages continued this great tradition when they said that the righteous of the nations of the world have a share in the world to come. The righteous of the nations of the world have a share in the world to come. In fact, if you go to Israel, the Holocaust Museum in Israel is called Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is a Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem and it contains names of more than 
20,000 righteous Gentiles who, were, who got saved during the Holocaust years. In fact, those, some of you know of uh, Adi Bidian, Rabbanovitz Bidian, who basically spoke in some of our services over here on special Holocaust Remembrance Days. In fact, she, she, she is planning to come to India. That means those of you who like to understand the Holocaust and how it had impact during those days, we'd like to have a meeting. We'll talk about that later. Now, this is what Adi said. She, she's talking about an event that took place last month in the month of June 11th, 2023. She said that she was on an exciting mission that gave me a perspective on the righteous among the nations. Can we put the next slide? This is Yad Vashem. This is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. All these trees are planted in memory of more than 20,000 righteous Gentiles who saved the lives of Jewish people during the times of the Holocaust. As you walk through this, these are not Jewish people. Some of them are Christians, some of them are not Christians. I mean, some of you have heard of Cory Ten Boot, who basically saved and hid many Jewish people. All of their names, each tree, each plant is basically over there. In fact, this is what Adi says concerning uh, her new perspective on the righteous among the nations. She said she has a friend from Canada, Boney. Davis Patterson, who told her that she has a friend whose uncle and aunt were righteous among the nations, Albert and Henke Ma'atan, Matman. They planted a tree in Yad Vashem, and now she wants to know what it looks like. And this seems to Adi a, a very exciting mission. After receiving from Yad Vashem the location of the tree on the map, she said, I went to look for it. And she says, you must understand, you don't get the exact location, more like the area of the tree or the mountain of memory is covered with so many trees of the righteous among the nations. I was walking in that area, trying to look for the tree in a forest, as if this wasn't hard enough, this became a construction area. And I was saddened to see lots of construction materials in the forest, which should have been sealed and disconnected from the construction site. Some of the trees were missing the signs. Some signs were disconnected. I was praying to God to help me to find that tree. Finally, I came across a sign covered with asphalt and only three letters were written, A-L-B. I took a big stone, broke the asphalt, and finally saw Albert and Henke, Matman. I started jumping with joy. Albert and Henke Matman, they hid 17-year-old Zipporah Karmer and her sick cousin Meta in Holland. They refused to receive any compensation. Aside from the Karma girls, the Matmans provided many other Jews with places to hide during the war. The tree that you see is planted in remembrance of the Matmans, Albert and Henke Matmans. When you come to the Holocaust Museum, you get constant reminders of humans' worst abilities. Tour guides of Yad Vashem always talk about the righteous among the nation. And it is always impressive. But to me, walking around all these trees, understanding the significance of each and every one of these trees represents lives that are saved. Each of this has a sign. Each was planted at a different time. Each may be searched for by a relative or a survivor or a descendant. Each of these trees, it represents people. Men, women, who sacrifice their own life for the gospel, for their faith in God, and protected the chosen people of God, the Jewish people. Are you with me? 
So God does not only appear to Jews, members of the covenantal nation, nor does he only appear to answer Jewish prayers. But these are people who responded to the call of God, who protected Jews during the times of difficulties. Nor is it that God's covenant with the children of Israel means that they are more righteous than others. In fact, Malachi, who is one of the last prophets, has these words to say upon the subject. He's, Malachi says in Malachi chapter 1, verse 11 through 12, he says, from where the sun rises to where it sets, my name is honored among the nations. And everywhere incense and pure oblation are offered to my name. For my name is honored among the nations, says the Lord of hosts, but you profane it. I mean, this is amazing. From the rising of the sun to its going down, every nation of the world has righteous men, women, young and old, who basically offers the name of God, glorifies the name of God, gives lies that belong to God. Nor did any of the major strands in Jewish thought ever see Jewish chosenness as a privilege. Being called by God, being close to God, being chosen by God is not a privilege, friends. When we get engrafted to the Jewish people through the Messiah, it is not a privilege. You know what it is? You want to know what it is? It is a responsibility. It was a responsibility and it is a responsibility. That means if I have accepted the Messiah and through the Messiah Yeshua, according to Paul, that I am engrafted to the Jewish people, that means I cannot continue to live the life I want to live according to the world, but I need to live a life that is set apart, which means I may lose everything. I may, I may not have everything, but it's only me and my God. We all sing that song. The cross before me, the world behind me. Is it really what it means? We all sing that song. I have decided to follow Yeshua. This is what it means to follow Yeshua. Following Yeshua is following in the paths of righteousness. And the paths of righteousness is following the Torah. Following God's word. Because the Torah is the scriptures that the master lived on. The key verse here is the famous prophecy of Amos, Amos 3.2. Amos says, you alone have I singled out of all the families of the earth. And this is why I will call you to account for all your iniquity. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. He's going to call you for your iniquity. You can't get away with your sin. You can't get away with your unrighteousness. You will have to give an account for every word you said, every thought you had, and every action that you made that was ungodly. Because that's what it means to live a godly life. Isn't that what the Ramkal says? Come to Keshbon. Come to accountability. Come to a place of intervening into your life and see what it means to walk in the paths of righteousness. Where then did Jewish singularity lie? The clue lies in the precise wordings of Bilam's blessing in this week's Torah portion. Behold, it is a people that dwells alone. Walking with Hashem means you're going to dwell alone. You know that's why I tell people, if you're walking with God, that's why the most important people in your life should be your community. I'm not saying that you should cut yourself away from the people. It's just that because when you begin to live a lifestyle that is different from others, others cannot get along with you. And if they're getting along with you, basically it basically means you're not living a lifestyle according to the Torah. You're not, you're not throwing them away, but you're living a different lifestyle because this lifestyle is going to bring glory and honor to Hashem. This lifestyle is going to bring honor to Hashem and people will know and understand through your ways and through your lives what it means to serve God. For it was as a people that God chose the descendants of Abraham. As a people that he made a covenant with them on Mount Sinai. And as a people he rescued them from Egypt. Gave them laws and entered into their history. And what does he say in Exodus 19.6? 
You will be to me, he said at Mount Sinai, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You know what it means to be a kingdom of priests? That means a, king, a priest cannot mingle himself into the affairs of the world. Does that mean I should not work? No, that does not mean. I may work, but I cannot do, I cannot live, I cannot think, I cannot behave, I cannot dress, I cannot, I cannot live like the world. Because I'm a holy nation. Because I'm a priest unto God. I'm set apart. I'm different. Some may accept it. Some may not accept it. It doesn't matter. I'm accepted by God. And that's the most important thing. Are you with me? Judaism is the only religion to place God at the center of its self-definition as a nation. You want to define what the nation is? God. You want to define your identity? God. Your identity is not in your <sighs> academics, your allocates, your prices, your prestiges, your money, your palaces. No. God is the center, should be the center of your life. As a community, as an individual, Jews are the only nation whose very identity is identified in religious terms. They were, there were many nations in the ancient world who had national gods. There were other religions, basically Judaism's two daughters of faith, Christianity and Islam. They believed in a universal God and a universal religion. Only Judaism believed and still believes in a universal God accessible to all, yet per peculiarly manifest in the way of life, fate, and destiny of a single and singular people. And that is why it says in Isaiah 43, 10 to 12, you are my witness, declares the Lord, and the servant whom I have chosen. You are my witness, declares the Lord, that I am God. Are you the witness of God? Is your lifestyle a witness to Hashem? Israel in its history and laws would be God's witness. In your history, in your laws, you are supposed to be a witness unto God. In your lifestyle, in your actions, with your communication, with your relationship, with your love for one another, love for God, it should be a witness, a testimony for God. I would testify to something larger than itself. So it, it proved to be. This is what Barbara Tuckman wrote. Barbara Tuckman wrote, the history of the Jews is intensely pecu peculiar in the fact of having given the Western world its concept of origins and monotheism, its ethical traditions, and the founder of its prevailing religion, yet suffering dispersion, statelessness, ceaseless persecution, and finally in our times nearly successful genocide, dramatically followed by fulfillment of the never relinquished dream to return to their homeland. Viewing the strange and singular history, one cannot escape the impression that it must contain some sex special significance for the history of mankind. That in some way, whether one believes in divine purposes or inscrutable circumstances, the Jews have been singled out to carry the tale of human fate. Powerful. Why if God is the God of the universe, if he's accessible to human beings, should he choose one nation to bear witness to his presence in the human arena? Why one nation? This is a great question, but the answer is not shocked. Why did God choose the Jewish people? All the other nations were given this opportunity. All the other nations did not respond. They did not take it upon themselves. The Jewish people through Abraham said, yes, I will follow you. 
we through the through through the messiah and what he has done for us we have been engrafted into that special purpose and we also are saying yes i will follow you so the answer is the question is profound but there is no short answer but at least at, at, but the least ans- answer i believe is that god is holy other therefore he chose a people who would be humanity's other god is whole he shall live he is perfect and he chose a people he chose you he chose the jewish people he chose our ancestors to be the humanity's other the question is will you be god's other to show forth his glory this is what the jews were and in many ways still are outsiders different distinctive a people who swam against the tide and challenged the idols of the age judaism is the counter voice in the conversation of humanity during the 2000 years of dispersion jews were the only people who as a group refused to assimilate to the dominant culture or convert to the dominant faith as a result of that what happened they suffered as a result and what they thought was not for themselves alone they showed that a nation does not need to be powerful or large to win god's favor they showed that as a nation uh, that 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 a nation can lose everything else land power rights a hope but yet they will not still lose hope they showed that god is not necessarily on the side of great empires and big battlelands they showed that as a nation can be hated persecuted reviled yet still be loved by god they showed that to every law of history there was an exception and what the majority believes at any given moment is not necessarily true judaism is god's question mark against conventional wisdom of this age it is neither an easy nor comfortable fate to be a people that dwells alone but to be a people that dwells alone is a challenge and it is an inspirational one are you willing to be that people are you willing to be engrafted to that people are you willing to be part of that people this is what hashem is calling us because if you are then we are inviting the torah we are inviting hashem into the house of god and by inviting the torah and hashem into the house of god you know what we are doing we are preparing a mishkan over here in hyderabad for god so that because of us god will have mercy not only upon us but the nations around us the cities around us the states around us and he would favor us with his grace and his with his love the torah coming to us yes it is of great joy but it also means of great responsibility why responsible i am responsible for one another I'm responsible to make to keep each other on account that each of us are going to walk in the ways of God. I'm responsible that I'm going to walk in the ways of God. I'm going to I'm responsible to catch every each other's collar to make sure that we walk in the ways of God in covenant to one another and in covenant with God. Amen. A people that dwells alone. The hardest word is no. but no is because hashem loves you and because he says no we might not do what the world does that's fine 